Did you feel that? That was an earthquake. What is an earthquake? And why do we feel them? It might surprise you to learn that earthquakes are happening every day on our planet. Just last month, the strongest earthquake to hit the state of Massachusetts in over 50 years was felt in Fall River, Massachusetts. The earthquake was reported by over 14,000 people to the United States Geologic Survey, a government organization that's responsible for monitoring earthquake activity all over the world, but especially in the USA. Let's use this model and our imaginations to explain how earthquakes occur. We spend almost all of our time on what we call the surface of the Earth, the very topmost layer of our Earth, where our buildings are erected and we spend our lives walking, driving, traveling from place to place. But there's a whole rest of our planet beneath that surface. And that's where the action is when it comes to what causes earthquakes. You see, not too far beneath the Earth's surface and what we call the rocky crust is a much more fluid, molten mantle and Earth's core, which is very hot and creates pressures in different directions that with enough time can cause our Earth's crust to crack. A crack like this is known as a fracture. Just like when you crack a bone, but you don't break it. Of course, there are times when there's enough energy and force pushing or pulling or tearing at our Earth's crust that would cause that rocky, brittle, topmost section of our Earth to break and move. And we call that an earthquake. Watch what happens when I start to apply a pushing force to these two pieces of Earth's surface. As I push and push and push, the Earth will eventually move on along that fractured crack line. Right? When that move occurs and a shift is created in our Earth's surface, that fracture becomes what's known as a fault. And fault lines are evidence that earthquakes have occurred in different locations on Earth's surface. Earthquakes create a variety of seismic waves that move through the Earth's surface. To give you an example of some of these seismic waves, I've brought out a favorite childhood toy, a slinky. This slinky is going to model our Earth's surface and what happens to it when different kinds of seismic waves move through our Earth's surface. So you have to use your imagination and think that humans and trees and buildings would all be built up along the top of our slinky here. Now usually when an earthquake strikes, it releases its energy in seismic waves that move through our Earth's surface at different speeds. The first seismic wave that humans typically feel during an earthquake is known as the primary wave because primary means first. It's the first wave that strikes and it forces the Earth to move in a manner a bit like this. What do you notice about that motion? How is the Earth moving during a primary wave?
the Earth's surface is squeezing and stretching, a little bit like an accordion. It's compressing in some sections and then getting stretched out in others, and it's repeating that motion in a pattern, which is what makes it a wave. After primary waves pass, we commonly feel what's known as an S wave or secondary wave, because secondary, of course, means come second. These waves move a little bit differently. Remember, the primary wave moved like this. Notice how my hand motion is back and forth in the direction of our slinky. But now watch what happens when we create a secondary wave. Watch what happens to the slinky and how my hand is creating that motion. Here we go. You might have noticed that my hand is still making a back and forth motion, but this time it's up and down or perpendicular to the Earth's surface. This causes our Earth's surface to move in a more S-like pattern. Imagine being a human or a building on a surface that was moving like that. Yikes! Modern day scientists use a seismograph to record seismic waves passing through them and the environment around them. Seismographs are very sensitive to motion. You'll notice that there's a magnet attached to this lever, which is held up or suspended by a spring. Anytime motion passes through the surface that the seismograph is on, this arm will move ever so slightly. The magnet causes an electric current to pass through the coil of wire that's wrapped in between that magnet. That current passes through wires to a computer attached to the seismograph. The computer runs software that understands the electric signal coming from the seismograph and interprets it into data that scientists can make sense of, called seismograms. Seismograms are nothing more than a line drawn on a piece of paper or digital screen that gets dragged along over time. And as vibrations occur, the needle moves up and down to record the seismic wave. By comparing the seismograms recorded at different seismograph stations, Scientists can determine where the earthquake occurred, a location known as its epicenter. Many modern day seismographs use a special piece of hardware in their electronic equipment known as a gyroscope. A gyroscope is a sensor that detects motion in different directions. Your iPad and iPhone and other digital devices that you might use for games to detect motion all use gyroscopes. I'm using an app downloaded to my iPad right now to demonstrate how a gyroscope works and visualizes the data it receives to show waves of motion. For example, when I move my iPad, 
in this motion, you see a wave shape forming on that topmost line that measures what's known as the y-axis. If we move in this direction, we see a wave form on that second line. That second line is measuring motion along the plane known as the x-axis. In this example, our device has moved in two different planes of motion. Older students familiar with graphing know that the y-axis stretches on forever, both up and down, while the x-axis stretches on forever from left to right, or forwards and backwards in time, according to a seismograph. But what about that third line we see in our seismograph app? What direction does that measure? The z-axis can be demonstrated by me creating some vibrations right here. How might that tapping be affecting the motion of my iPad? Remember that taps are vibrations. Vibrations that send waves of motion through an object even as solid looking as this table. Those waves are actually moving our iPad ever so slightly up and down. You can see this more dramatically when I pick up the iPad like this. All gyroscopes monitor and measure one or more planes of motion. There are over seven and a half billion people on our planet, many of which live along coastlines like those in Asia and in North and South America where earthquakes frequently happen. We're not going to be able to move people out of places where earthquakes occur. You have to learn to live with them and to build structures that are capable of handling the vibrations that earthquakes create. Which is why Structural engineers develop solutions that help prevent damage to buildings when earthquake seismic vibrations pass through them. Here's a great example of what vibrations might do to a building that is not supported by any structures that would prevent them from collapsing during an earthquake. I have here a model of the framework of a three-story building. If even a small vibration comes through that causes this building to start to shake and crumble, then you're going to have a situation where the building will collapse on its own weight from the force of gravity. Yikes! Engineers build in what we call substructures, smaller structures within a structure like a building, to help support the building's weight during the vibrations of an earthquake. One kind of substructure is what we might call a shear wall. Now, a shear wall is just a big piece of material that is attached at all four sides of the wall that it's supporting. So I'm going to attach or bolt this shear wall to all four sides of our structure. Hmm. So we'll see that when we create a vibration, the floor that includes the shear wall 
stays up, saving the lives and property of anything here. Well, the structures on the first and the third floor that were not supported have collapsed. Now, shear walls are one solution, but they can be very heavy and expensive because of the material required to put them together. So engineers have also created smaller substructures, like gussets, that attach not in four places, but in two, supporting the floors and walls of the corners that they attach to, and also structures known as cross members that when used together can support parallel structures like the walls of this first floor. You might have noticed that it started to buckle even with one cross member, which is why it's helpful to have two. Now, depending on how strong or the amplitude of the earthquake is, right, some structures will hold up to smaller earthquakes, but might not be able to handle really severe earthquakes. Engineers have to balance the cost, the weight, and the safety of the structures they build to meet the needs of the populations that they're serving. Not an easy job. That does it for our Wild Wednesday today. What are you still wondering about earthquakes? Keep in mind that even though we just experienced an earthquake here in November, Earthquakes are not very common at all in the state of Massachusetts. And when earthquakes do occur here in our state, they are often minor earthquakes and can't be felt. So have a wonderful day, stay curious, and I hope to hear from you.